On this episode, I had the privilege of sitting down with Ben Hardy and Mike Marinda, the hosts of Terrain Theory Podcast. And you can imagine, given that their podcast is called Terrain Theory Podcast, we're aligned on a lot of things and we're definitely aligned on water fasting. Um, so in this episode, I share my experience of water fasting and Mike is in the middle of day three at the time that we're recording this by now he's probably on day 10 if he continued i'll have to check in with him um and ben has done a few water fasts i think the longest he's done is eight days so we all have direct experience with water fasting so we share our experiences the challenges the benefits why we wanted to water fast we go into all the details on water fasting that you would probably want to know if you've not done one before and um it's kind of like a, obviously a joke at this point, how much I bring up water fasting on this podcast and I'm just obsessed with water in general. So of course I was super passionate during this episode and we went um, pretty deep on, on a lot of stuff related to water fasting and uh, definitely recommend checking out their podcast. You can find that, I believe at terraintheory.net. I'll put the link to their podcast in the show notes, another fantastic podcast with uh, a lot of great guests. We actually have featured quite a few of the same guests on our respective shows. Um, and then the other thing I want to bring up again is Confluence, April 5th through the 8th. Uh, tickets are selling really fast. This event is looking to be really incredible. And if you want to just hang out with like-minded freedom and health and I guess you could say esoteric community on a regenerative farm, eat a bunch of organic food the entirety of the event, um, swim in a magnesium rich pond, listen to Andy Kaufman talk about law this year. And also Brandon Joe Williams, who will be a guest here soon. Um, Amanda Vollmer, Eileen McCusick, myself, Molly Englehart, uh, Aaron Abke, Veda Austin, a number of incredible speakers. And we have awesome workshops and then music lined up from five times August, Deepak, uh, Christine Marie Castaneda, BJ Fisher, and Mike Winner, of course, will be doing some incredible DJ sets. So if you want to experience all of that, attend Confluence. Link uh, for tickets is in the show notes, and I promise you, you will not regret it. It's such an incredible experience. So without further ado, here is the episode with the guys from Terrain Theory Pod on water fasting. What's up, guys? Alec, it's great to see you and really excited to learn a little bit about your, your water fast journey. Yeah, stoked to talk about it. It's something I'm really passionate about. Let's kick off with why did you do one? What made you want to do a water fast? So I'd interviewed Lauren Lockman for episode 10 of my podcast in sometime at the tail end or the very beginning of tail end of 2022 or very beginning of 2023. And I don't remember exactly when, but I, I think it was towards the end of 2022. And previous to that, I had discussed water fasting with uh, Dr. Grayson Dart and then also Dr. Andy Kaufman, who had both done, I know Andy's was 26 days and Grayson's, I don't remember the exact length, but then there's another guy who's in that terrain chat with us. I, I don't know his actual name. I think it's just Z and I don't, I don't know what his last name is, but he shared his experience of doing an extended water fast and talked about how he was somewhat healthy prior to the fast, but um, just felt like he got a completely new body after he completed the 27, he did 27 days and he did it guided by Lauren Lockman as well. So after all those things, interviewing Lauren, I wanted to do one right after interviewing Lauren, but didn't really have the the time or space to do it. And I think I wanted to a little bit before that. And it's not that I had any crazy physical thing that I was dealing with health-wise that necessitated a water fast by any means, but it was more wanting to do it for 
just experimenting on myself. But then I'll say also, I felt like there was some <clears throat> lingering emotional slash spiritual slash psychosomatic uh, mental things that I was dealing with that I was aware of that I wanted to just face that I, that I wanted to sit with without any distractions, knowing that I couldn't cope with food, uh, minimize the amount of work that I was doing and just sit with myself and my thoughts and my emotions and overcome them. So that's kind of why I wanted to do it. And it really all came to a head after launching the end of COVID, the build up to that was extremely stressful. I mean, it was, it was a nine month, nine or 10 month project that, the the hours that I was putting into that was insane. Like I wasn't taking time on weekends to really spend with my family or like focusing on self-care. So I guess you could say in some ways my health had gotten to a pretty poor state, relatively speaking. Um, and then I was just so, so, so stressed mentally. And there was some financial stuff we were dealing with at that time and just feelings of unworthiness because of the financial stuff. And like, even thinking about quitting doing everything that I'm doing. Like I'm talking, there's one day that I wrote this like long paragraph that I was going to send all, all the way forward members um, or multi-paragraph document that I was going to send to all the members and send to my team and send to everyone just be like, I'm done and I'm going to go get an engineering job <laughs> or you know, work as a, as a plumber, like Dr. Cowan always says, something, I don't know. And I, and I was close to sending it because I had just reached such a low point because I wasn't, a, I wasn't providing for my family like I'd wanted to and was working my ass off. And I'm so glad I didn't do that because the end of COVID ended up being fruitful financially and obviously helped a ton of people. But um, yeah, that's, that's where I was at. And so after we launched the end of COVID, I was like, I just need to go off and face myself. I really, really need to go face myself. I've been wanting to do this for a while anyway. I think this is a perfect time to do it. So I did it in the started it in the beginning of July and ended it in August. And it was 15 days water with one day of juice at the beginning and one day of juice at the end, which I would not recommend. So 17 days total. I, and I can explain why I wouldn't recommend juice, but that's, that's why I did it. And, um, you know, it was incredible. So we can get into it. I, I do remember you maybe on telegram, one of your channels, I remember you teasing, out those feelings of of wanting to step away mm -hmm. uh, and maybe taking an engineering job. I, I mean, I think you actually bounced that into one of the Telegram channels, and and it wasn't long after that that I that you announced that you were doing this fast. And I think you might have said something like you were going to step away from social a little bit at the time. And I remember thinking this guy, and I knew how much time was going into the end of COVID because you you also talked about that. Um, and I remember seeing you post first in Telegram about wanting to step away or toying with the idea of it, and then the water fest and thinking, this guy's burnt out. Like, this guy is at, at the end. And it's a really fascinating thing to think that in that state of burnout and the feelings of unworthiness, that you strip away food and, and do a water fast that that would be the mechanism to right the ship and center and ground where I think so many other people might turn to a comfort, perhaps uh, alcohol or drugs or friends or do a vacation and go somewhere. This is like the most austere thing you can do is take away food and go inwards. Yeah. I think the reason that I chose fasting was because I didn't want to cope with anything. I didn't want to turn to anything outside of myself to deal with what I was dealing with. I just knew that I needed to turn inward to deal with what I was dealing with and that solutions could only be found after I had cleansed myself of all that I needed to cleanse myself of be it physical toxins or emotional, spiritual, um, mental toxins, if you will. Uh, 
And, and that's why I chose fasting. And again, I had already had the inclination to, to fast. And I talked with Andy Kaufman and I said, what was the most challenging part about your fast? And this isn't a direct quote by any means, but he said, one of the biggest challenges was having to face the emotions that surface. And I'd heard that from a lot of other people. And I knew that, um, logically or, or, um, you know, how do I put this? I, I, I knew, I knew that the idea that abundance is, is an internal process and that my feelings of unworthiness were something that I was suffering with because of something inside of me, not because of something external. Right. And I knew that logically, but I didn't feel that. And so I needed to reconcile those two things. And that could only be done in my mind by just facing myself in, um, in a very intense way with no distractions. And that's what fasting facilitates because you don't, I mean, I could have like turned to just scrolling on my phone all the time and things like this, but I was very intentional about it. But at the least you're not eating food. So you're, you're not distracted with those things and your body, uh, is not pushing energy towards digestion. So, um, you're, you're sort of just faced or forced to face some of those things that you may have not faced before. Before we get into this fast, did you have any past experiences with fasting prior to this 15 day? I had done like a medical medium 369 cleanse. I had done like a five day water fast or something like that, but it wasn't super intentional. It was just like waking up one day and thinking, okay, I'm going to fast and just see how long I can do this. There's no, it, it wasn't intentional. Um, so I, I didn't have any like direct experience of prolonged fasts and I'll also say that I didn't do a lot of prep work before this fast either. And I probably should have, I'd recommend that for other people. Um, but no, not really like a ton of experience with fasting beforehand. So let's talk about this one. You started with juice on day one and then 15 days of water ended with juice. Let's get into it. Like what was your approach? What, what preparation did you do? And then let's talk about some of those more like memorable or notable moments. Yeah. So the preparation that I did is the day before the first day of juice. So let's call the first day of juice day one, I guess. And then the last day was day 17. And that was another day of juice with 15 days of water in between. So um, prior to day one, I ate only whole fruits by themselves, just single fruits. And what is recommended by Lauren Lockman and other people is to do uh, an extensive period of eating raw lettuce or just raw fruits, mono fruits by themselves um, to sort of prep your body to receive less or no nutrients, you know, um, and eating mono fruits. So your body's digestion starts to work to receiving no food whatsoever. And, um, I didn't do that. I didn't do that at all. I actually just uh, did one that one day of fruit, and then the next day I did just a day of all fruit juices. And in that day, I drove 14 hours from where I live in Texas to where my dad lives in Crested Butte, Colorado. And that was kind of my excuse not to do water on that day was because I wanted some form of, of nutrients in driving that long. Um, I don't know. It just made sense in my mind. But um, yeah, and then it was 15 days once I got to Crested Butte of just straight water. And um, we can get into exactly what I did with that. But your second question, the most memorable experiences while fasting were that um, and there's a, there's a, there's several things. So days five and six, I stand up paddle boarded on day five and had enough energy to do that was stand up paddle boarding on this, on this river for like four hours. And one thing that was super interesting is that, you know, Crested Butte, Colorado in the middle of the summer, 9,000 foot elevation, it's closer to the sun. And typically 
I, when I'm there, I burn like a motherfucker and I eat pretty healthy. Right. But even that I still burn the first day and then it turns into a tan and I'm like, so against using sunscreen of any type, even zinc. And I only have done it on occasion in the past couple of years. I just let myself burn if I need to burn and then it turns into a tan or I'll peel or my skin will get boils and stuff on it. Whatever. I just, I just don't use sunscreen. And on this day that I stand up paddleboarded outside, I had my shirt off most of the time and there was not a cloud in the sky and I did not burn at all, which was really, really interesting. Mm. So that was sort of a direct experience that um, we burn for dietary reasons. And again, I am a generally healthy dude who eats very clean, but I'm not so obsessive that my wife and I don't occasionally go out and have a meal at a restaurant, mm -hmm. right? And where they're, they might cook with seed oils, yeah, whatever, right? Um, so that was a direct experience that, it's likely that uh, that having skin issues related to the sun is related to what we're putting inside of our bodies. Because when I wasn't putting anything inside my body, I did not burn. But what was also interesting about that is that I did have enough energy to stand up paddleboard. Now, I wouldn't recommend that anyone else does this necessarily. And I, when it comes to fasting in general, I highly recommend that you do it guided with someone who's knowledgeable about fasting and has guided other people through fast. And there's resources that I can share with how to do that um, the correct way. But um, yeah, I had enough energy at 9,000 foot elevation where it's already kind of, you know, hard to, to catch your breath and, um, and have energy. And I stand up paddleboard and I was completely fine. And the hunger sort of subsided after days three and four. So days one, two, three, and four, I was super hungry, craving food so much. And then after those days, I had a sort of energy pickup and the desire for food sort of subsided and I didn't feel the need to eat anything. And, um, really started to feel direct experience that, just by breathing deeply, just by having good conversations, you know, I was with my dad for some of it, um, just by standing bare feet on bare earth, just by looking directly at the sun. I spent every morning doing Qigong, bare feet on bare earth, looking at the sun. Uh, I felt satiated. I felt nourished. And that's, that really started days five onward. And that continued through the duration of the fast where I did not experience any hunger. And if I started feeling depleted of energy, I would do breath work. I would, um, you know, just go put my feet on the earth and I would feel energized. I would feel nourished. I would feel satiated. And that was really incredible. And the, the, I think the most impactful day was day 13. And I shared an update on this Telegram channel that I set up for uh, those who are interested in following my fasting experience. Day 13 was very challenging in that a lot of emotions came up. And I don't know why it was specifically day 13. Like there was emotions that came up every day and I cried pretty much every day mm -hmm. during my fast. And it's again, because I cannot avoid dealing with my shit. I had to just sit there and be with it. Um, you know, I could, could avoid it, so to speak, by doing breath work or things like this, but there's, there's no turning to food and, you know, you could easily turn back to like past addictions or current addictions for those who have them. But I was very, very intentional about just being with the emotions as they came up. And just feeling them, not avoiding them, not trying to breathe my way out of them, just being present with them and feeling them as they arise. And day 13, I bawled my eyes out the entire day. I got really angry in some parts of the day. Um, and it was it was cathartic. It was, it was very challenging. But after sort of emptying myself of those emotions and just allowing them to flow through me, the bliss that I experienced 
was unlike anything that I had ever experienced in my life. And that is not an exaggeration. I mean, I've done some pretty profound breathwork experiences, Qigong and things like this. And I, like I said, I was doing Qigong every morning, but just by emptying myself of everything physically and metaphysically, so to speak, the, the bliss that I felt just being, just doing nothing, just sitting there. It did help that I was surrounded by 360 degree mountain views in, in a place that's not very populated, but just being present with myself, empty of everything. I had never felt more connected to God, connected to my surroundings, and I'd never felt more grateful in my life. Um, and I remember that a friend of mine, Mike Cardamone, had said to me before this fast, he's done a, a number of fast of different types he's done like grape fast like where he only eats concord grapes for like a month and then he's done like uh like <laughs> urine fast for quite some th- he's done some pretty he's done some pretty like cool experiments on himself i guess you could say and what he said to me is you will fall in love with the feeling of emptiness and you don't really know or understand what that means until you experience it. And that's what that direct experience showed me. And so day 14 after that very, very, very emotional day 13 was incredible. I mean, I just sat there in awe of life itself, in awe of existence, in awe of my body, in awe of everything around me and all of my kids and my wife and the relationship and the family that I have and just felt so blessed and even so blessed to have gone through all of the challenging things that I've gone through in my life with respect to my childhood trauma and previously my relationship with my dad, which was really shitty growing up. And it's, it's really good now, which is, which is incredible, but also stuff that I've been dealing with my mom and that, that is, you know, still happening to this day. And, just, just grateful for all of it, even the stuff that I was currently dealing with, like I said, and even the, 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 the pressure cooker that I felt that I had been in over the last several months related to being in a poor situation financially. I was just so grateful for everything because it had brought me to this point and this point of needing nothing, literally nothing, like not food, not, you know, just nothing, just sitting there by myself and feeling just total bliss. Hmm. Like, how could I not be grateful for that? Hmm. And that's what I felt on day 14. And I also had shared on day 14 that uh, in my update, like, wow, I feel like I could do this forever. Again, not feeling any hunger at all on day 14. I was like, I really feel like I could do this forever. And I think I could have done it for a much, much, much longer. But um, I'm, I'm so blessed that my wife let me leave her and the kids back in Texas so I could go do this fast. And I, I felt that I really needed to do it. And she totally understood. And she'll even say to this day that after that fasting experience, I'm a changed man. Like I still have my days and I still have my days where I'm like pissed off or a little bit too angry or irritable. I'm a human being, but overall I'm a changed man after having done that fasting experience. But she, she called me day 14. She said, Hey, um, if, uh, I wake up tomorrow and feel like that this is too challenging being with the kids by myself for, for another day after, you know, this is, this is the beginning of day 14, then I need you to come home. And I was like, totally understandable. And my plan was to finish the fast at home. And this was another thing that was really interesting was that Driving home, I bought spring water from a grocery store that was, quote, spring water (laughs) in plastic jugs Mm -hmm. uh, at a local grocery store. And throughout my fast, I was either drinking real spring water that was bubbling up from a spring Mm -hmm. in Crested Butte or just outside of Crested Butte, or I was drinking uh, reverse osmosis water that I would sometimes remineralized, sometimes not, but I would use the analemma wand to um, bring back into coherence. And for those that are interested, I, I think you guys have done a podcast with those guys, right? Yeah. So, so have we, so definitely check out those. There's some pretty incredible studies that they've conducted on how 
basically showing that their their wand absolutely does bring water back into coherence. Um, all that being said, that's what I was doing with my water that I was drinking. And this experience of having to drive home without an analemma wand present, you know, I was still blessing my water and things like this being very intentional. But I noticed that on day 15 on my drive home, day 16, if you include the first day that was juice, right? So day, day 15 of water, driving 14 hours from uh, Crested Butte back to Texas, um, that I was drinking this water in the same fashion that I had been drinking the actual spring water or the, or the reverse osmosis water that was brought back into coherence. And despite that, I needed to pee so much, mm. which was sort of telling me that, wow, this is not really hydrating me. This is not nourishing me. And I didn't feel nourished. And I started to get a headache and then my mouth started to feel really dry. Mm. It's like, this is really, really interesting. This is claimed to be spring water. So all that being said that this was direct experience, especially because I was so sensitive to feeling nourished by things other than food, by breathing, by, you know, like I said, putting my feet on there, staring at the sun, um, that the water we drink really, really matters. It really matters because when I was drinking this water, that was claimed to be spring water that had been sitting in a plastic jug. I did not feel hydrated. I did not feel nourished. And I was having to pull over so much on the drive to go pee. And uh, by the end, when I got home, I had a gnarly, gnarly, gnarly headache. My mouth felt extremely dry. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll drink some RO water. And we had an analemma wand here. When I was at my dad's, I was using his, so I couldn't bring an analemma wand with me, right? I couldn't, you know, bring the water back into coherence that I was drinking. And um, I woke up the next morning on what would have been day 16 of water, planning to continue because I was d- going to do 21 days. I was set on doing 21 days. And I did Qigong in the morning, put my feet on the earth, and, you know, did my sun gazing. And typically when I do Qigong, especially so during the fast, it would slow my heart rate and just make me feel very still and present within myself. But doing Qigong on day 16, after having that pretty gnarly day 15 with a raging headache, my heart rate sped up and I started to get really bad tunnel vision. So I was like, okay, it's time for me to stop. But I don't know if this is like, my my military mind kicking in and or my type a person i don't know what to call it but i had already like set that i was going to do 21 (laughs) days so i was like all right well if i'm not going to do water i'm at least going to do juice (laughs) to finish this fasting cleansing experience and i started drinking juice and that was the worst experience ever (laughs) i was like horrible I don't understand the exact mechanism that happens in the body when you've sort of turned off digestion um, and then reintroduce something that requires digestion. I, I don't know, but I'd imagine it's that when, when you break your fast, people like Lauren Lockman and Andy Kaufman would recommend breaking your fast by introducing single fruits slowly very sparingly throughout the day and then building your way up and then maybe introducing bone broth and things like this. And I think the logic behind that, I'm not going to speak for them, but I think the logic behind that, uh, is that you want to actually give your body some substance to sort of trigger like, Oh, this is food that I need to digest. Okay. And with, juice specifically you're denaturing all of the material when you're drinking juice like it's it's not it it doesn't have um the fibers and things like this that um sort of trigger digestion so i think it was confusing to my body in that oh this is liquid that we've been dealing with wait this liquid has a lot of other shit in it maybe we need to flush this out i don't really know but like i had this is TMI and I, I don't really care because it's the truth. I had diarrhea, I think 20 times that day just from drinking like three juices throughout the day. And it was horrible, horrible. And it was different than 
the bowel movements I'd had during the fast, because I did have bowel movements days 13, 14, 15, which was also interesting. Mm. Um, this felt like my body was being poisoned. And, you know, I don't think it was being poisoned by fruit juice necessarily, but that's what it felt like. It did not feel like I was cleansing. It felt awful. So then I introduced fruit the next day and it started to subside a little bit, started to um, have some normal bowel movements and then did fruit for a couple of days and then introduced bone broth and then slowly worked my way up to, to introducing food. So, yeah, I just rambled a ton there on a lot of things. So yes. feel free to pull on any thread or share your own experience because I know you too. So Mike, you're in the middle of day three of a fast. I'm on day three. Ben in the past has done an eight day and eight day. more okay. recently a five day, Ben, I believe. I, uh, when Ben did his eight day, I was going to try and keep up with him, but I only, I, I ended it after two and a lot of emotions started coming up for me, uh, on day two. And just that, that instinct to just reach for food, we call it comfort food. It's almost like in your, when you're in a fast, all food is comfort food. That's just what it is. It it provides comfort. Um, I also realized during that first short one, which I learned a lot from and was grateful for, but, um, I didn't set the time aside to really like let myself rest. I was still driving the kids places and going to basketball games. And there's a lot of like frenetic energy. Um, whereas this one that I'm in now, I've had a busy February. We hosted our hoot festival early in the month. Um, I got a, a cold slash upgrade in the middle of the month. And I just did a recording session the last week, but now I'm sort of in the clear and I think that's going to make a big difference for me is knowing that I don't have the responsibilities that I generally have in a week, um, which can be erratic. I'm you know, a self-employed musician, so my weeks are very different week to week. But I know that I have the time to just like sink into this. Mm-hmm. And it's making a big difference. Um, my goal was just to get past day three. And day three, I'm just cruising right now. Um, and now talking to you, I'm wondering how long I'll go. My my daughter wants me to take her skiing on Saturday, so I'm gonna figure out how that plays. I mean, you just you did paddle boarding on day five. I did so th- I did paddle yeah, board, that, and that that surprised me because yeah. my dad had already booked it, and I felt bad to, sure. to cancel on him. So I was like, all right, I'll just come do it, and maybe I can sit down a lot of the time. And I was able to sit down yeah. quite a bit of it, um, kind of needed to because it was on a river, but. Like I had energy yeah. to paddle for four or five hours or however long it was and felt fine. Yeah. You've sort of emboldened me to maybe just cruise right through and, and take her skiing. And I imagine, you know, having to pee in snow pants is going to be challenging. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that might be the worst of it. Um, but yeah, if you're like ripping through glades runs by yourself, <laughs> that's different than like skiing with your yeah, daughter. You know? Yeah. And it, you know, it'll be a beautiful sunny day, I think. And it's all good. But the two things I've, I've realized in, in my exploration of this water fasting is, um, one, I think it's like you, you went to Crested Butte, like you, you, you had the, the grace of your wife to like hold down the fort. And so you could really just go be away and sink into this experience, And it sounds like that's just what you did. You spent a lot of time resting and breathing and being in the sun and being barefoot. I think that's a necessary component. Lauren Lockman, for those who don't know, his he's in Costa Rica and people go there to, to, to just veg hard. I suspect they're not like recreating so much. I think when you're at a water fasting retreat. So I think you need to give yourself permission to actually slow life down and sink into it. At least that seems to be true for me. Um, the other thing that's different this time is that I've had this sort of shoulder tension slash injury. I'm starting to call it now since November. Um, I had a five day tour and I think just like, again, as a musician being, uh, out of work since 2020 and then being thrust back into it with like sort of a long tour, um, that these muscles just sort of, they weren't having it. Like, well, you haven't done this in a long time. And the, I usually when stuff like that comes up, it just works itself out. I don't think too much about it. I do my morning stretching routine and breathing and I usually can write the shit, but this one's just not going away. And I've tried, you know, all the things. Um, but having this impetus, like, okay, water fast for some structural work, I think is kind of not my last resort, but it felt like, and it's been much easier navigating the fast, knowing that I have this very specific goal in mind, which is just sort of get my shoulder, um, back in line. 
Can I share my experience on that real yeah, quick? Yeah, please. Ben, you probably have stuff you want to share too, just while it's top of mind. Um, so, like I said, physically healthy, yeah. relatively speaking, but because of all the stress that had compounded, I was starting to deal with some hip and shoulder issues that I had previously dealt with. For those who don't know, this is hilarious to me, especially if you like look at my uh, card that I have from the VA. I am a 100% disabled American veteran, which is like <laughs> crazy to me. <laughs> You don't like choose that. Like I don't apply to be a hundred percent disabled. I, you know, I, I, I was awarded a hundred percent disability and it's because yeah. I was in the U S army world-class athlete program training as an Olympic athlete. We never qualified for Olympics, but I was training as a full-time athlete yeah. and I got injured quite a bit, both previous to being in the program and also during the program. And all those injuries were documented and counted as part of my service time. So I have, you know, two screws in my left shoulder and, <laughs> Handball, the, the sport that I played, for those that aren't familiar, it's like water polo on land, essentially, and it's really popular in Europe and South America, and you need a really good whipping motion with your arm to be able to throw well, yeah. and after I had had so shoulder surgery, knowing what I know now, I would have never done this, yeah. but I did have surgery. Yeah. And I had biceps tenodesis and rotator cuff repair, which is a really extensive surgery that's specific, specifically for throwers. I think that is riddled with a bunch of unproven assumptions, but that's the surgery that I had. And after having the surgery, my throwing mechanics were all out of whack. So I had to really use my upper body torque to throw rather than the whipping motion of my arm, yeah. which presented pop problems in my hip. So all that to say, yeah. that's where those injuries stem from. And I had slowly over time, uh, helped resolve some of those injuries, but because of the stress that I had been experiencing, all of those injuries came roaring back. I was having crazy shoulder issues, hip issues relative to what I was dealing with previously where I didn't feel like a disabled veteran. I started to feel like a disabled veteran hmm. again. And you're saying these came my, roaring back, uh, like in the midst of previous to the fast, previous, like, previous like to the in fast. the midst of end of COVID and like wrapping that all yes. up. So, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's interesting. Cause you said like, well, I didn't really have any stuff specific. I needed well, to work on, but it sounds, it about it sounds it like you yeah. did. Yeah. And I was like, no, I did. I absolutely did because yeah. that was the other thing that I experienced that I shared during my updates yeah. is that, and, and again, relatively speaking, like there's people who have way worse issues than me and I was still healthy. I was still like pushing weight, yeah. running, sprinting, doing all the things, but I was having some of those pains come back. During the fast, those things went away like crazy. Hmm. But the other thing that was interesting is I I developed insane rashes from like the middle of my bicep down to the bottom like of my obliques, hmm. just insane welts in both of my armpits. And you know I, I have a I have a tattoo sleeve on on my left arm which I'd imagine is not very right. <laughs> friendly to a uh, non-toxic lifestyle, right. but I have a tattoo sleeve in my arm. Yeah. And then in 2017, I received, I think like 10 vaccines in one sitting when I was in the army wow. in this arm as well. Yeah. And then I also have two screws in this shoulder. So there was more welts on this side of my body than there were this side, but there was an insane amount of welts that came up. And I think that was my body finally mobilizing yeah. the toxins that it had been storing um, and just the fat layers of my body. And I'm not like a super overweight dude, but that's what our body does. It, it sort of stores the toxins to, um, you know, shield us, so to speak, in our fat. And then once you're fasting, ketosis sets in, it starts burning ketones. So it's mobilizing those fat, uh, the, the fat, and then also detoxifying your cells by having the energy uh, that your body was typically using for digestion or using for other things. And now it's using that energy to facilitate detoxification. So it's detoxifying your cells. You hit autophagy and you also hit ketosis at the same time. So you're just mobilizing all the toxins in your body. So I had insane like welts on my armpits. I think it's also because I was dealing with a little bit of liver dysfunction previous to that, because when I was younger, I had years of getting freaking blackout drunk when I was in college, which, you know, is not very healthy and not good for your liver. Um, but so all that to say, I did detox pretty hardcore throughout my fast, but that pain went away. Like it, it was gone and it, and it hasn't come back. Amazing. Some of my digestive issues have come back that I was dealing with previous to the fast too, but that 
I know exactly what that deals with and it's indigestible anger mm -hmm. um, when it comes to German new medicine that I'm dealing with related to the situation with my mom. And, I, and I'm totally aware of what it is and it's all emotional. But all that to say is that I, I detox pretty hard. Now, the, the other thing that you brought up, Mike, you brought up um, – uh, the, the intentionality of going somewhere or, or just being very intentional about your fast. So I did try to do a five day after this 17 day experience at home and just live life normally right. working as much as I typically, it does, does not work. Cannot, it just cannot <laughs> be done. At least in my experience, like you need, that's my experience too. And that's why Ben seems like a freaking fasting rock star. Cause when you did that eight day, Ben, you were working your regular week and you know, we did an episode about it. Can you share about you, that, ben? You bought a house. I mean, you, you had some major life-changing things happen during that week. Yeah. I don't know this, how you did it. This was twenty. This was 2022. Um, it was in the lead up. It was, it was between like end of October going into November of 2022. Prior to that, around August, and I've shared this with, with uh, our audience, around August, I developed this rash on my body. Um, and I was up to that point, I was doing carnivore. I was about as fit as I've been in my lifetime, like lifting, hiking, running, biking, getting sun, like doing everything that we've learned through this, this journey with terrain. And all of a sudden I developed this rash, uh, end of, end of July, early August that started on my leg. And I thought at first it was poison ivy, it was like itching and it just spread like everywhere on my body, my arms, my legs. Wow. And it was intense. I did. I went to Mike's festival, the Hoot, and um, we had like a, a panel discussion with Tom Callum was there, a bunch of past guests, Danny Parrott. Danny Parrott too, yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, and after that, driving home, my body just was on fire. Like I couldn't talk. I didn't want to talk to anybody. Didn't want to pull over to go to the bathroom. I just wanted to get home, get into a bath and soak. And this rash on my body persisted. I thought at first it was poison ivy. I actually went to urgent care and they gave me, you know, topical steroids to put on. They didn't even confirm that it was maybe poison ivy. They're just like, here's topical steroids. I held off. Was on it that. itchy? So itchy oh, and burning. And it, and it was everywhere. It was, and I, nothing I could do to get rid of it. I actually ended up taking oral steroids just so I could sleep. Um, oh, and I resisted as long as I could. I, I tried uh, some DMSO from Amanda Volmer's. That didn't do anything. It, it sort of persisted. It, it, it faded a little bit, but it was still present. And it was hard for me to, to sleep at night because it was itchy. And so end of October, at this point, you know, I'd heard, we, I think we had Dr. Grayson Dart on. We had just had him um, on, yeah. We'd heard, you know, your experiences, Alec, just and with some of your guests. Uh, and I said, this is it. Like, I've got to do this. At the same time that, that this was going on, I think this, this was a lot of the stress contributing. That I was living in Vermont at the time. Um, my wife and I are separated. We've got a, a seven-year-old. He just turned seven. And we're trying to leave Vermont. And we're trying to get to New Hampshire because I'm on the board of a public charter school that's like a nature-based, outdoor-based school that just opened up here in New Hampshire. And we wanted to relocate to get my kid into this school and just get out of Vermont because Vermont was had, had gone really backwards during during COVID. I'd lost a lot of friends and um, did this fast at the same time that I was actively looking for real estate or a house, some way to get out of Vermont and do this as a unit, even though I'm not with my wife, like somehow do it all together, figure it all out <laughs> to get my kid Which into probably school. probably presented a lot of emotions <laughs> Every, and stuff too there. Everything. And, yeah. And, 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 uh, yeah. and I just said this, I have to do this fast cause I can't, I can't even think straight. I'm, so I do the fast. I start doing the fast and, um, at that, during that week, a piece of real estate, a house pops up in the town next to where the school is that we're trying to get to. And uh, it's like day three, day four. And I drive from Vermont to New Hampshire to come see this house. And there's a, there's a lot that there's a lot that I've got to like interject with. Met with this, met the family. I'm in the house right now. Like I, I remember the, 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 the dad came out of this very room that I'm in right now to meet me. And I discovered that they're a very Christian family. 
and they're Baptist. And we ne- immediately have a connection because my great grandfather was a Baptist minister. So that we, we kind of hit it off. But at the same time, you know, I'm asking him like, if you have, you had a lot of offers on this house, he's had offers. Some of them are cash offers. Like it sounds like maybe some of them are over, you know, over the asking price, which I can't compete with. And I leave not terribly optimistic, but at the same time, I'm like, I put my hat in the ring and I think I had a good conversation with this family. And it, during this water fest, starting on day one, day two, was when I started praying. And I, I had stepped away from God back when I was like 14, when my, my uh, older brother was diagnosed with cancer. I like just got pissed at God and, I, and that was it. That was like kind of the last time I had a relationship with him. And I started praying during this, this water fest and prayed every night just to talk to God. And after seeing this house, prayed specifically that the offer would be accepted. And that Monday, I got a call from my realtor and she's like, you're buying a house. Um, I, I can't even tell the story without getting emotional. Oh, that's incredible though. And it was the second to last day of, uh, of the water fest. And like during that same time, so during the water fest, I got to come back to the rash. This was the only thing that had up to that point had a positive impact. Like the rash basically disappeared and I could see like echoes of it, you know, after I would exert myself or sweat or maybe take a hot shower, like, Oh yeah, that, that happened. But it basically virtually disappeared. Wow. And then this, the offer was accepted on this house that took us to the next step, which was relocating all of us to New Hampshire and getting my son in the school where he is now. And I'm now the, the chair of the board and um, just this new community here in New Hampshire. And I think all of it came from, I don't think any of that would have happened. I, I truly believe I look back and I go, I don't think I'd be here right now in this place, in this very room, had I not done that water fast. And so I was, I was a changed man. But at that time, like during that time I worked, like I did, I got up during the day, I did everything I had to, you know, preparing meals for your kid, uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, while you're on a water fast is probably one of the most challenging things because you can't look away. You can't, I'm not pinching my nose and I'm <laughs> sitting there. And also he was very aware that I was doing a water fast and would hold like the spoon full of chili out at me. Like you want to, and then no, you can't have it. Just teasing me. Uh, good natured. But I, that made me a believer. Um, so the physical you know, sort of healing from this rash, which then after I started eating again, kind of came back, but then basically has disappeared. Like I haven't changed much since then. It's, it's all, but it's all but gone. And, uh, and here I am like in, in New Hampshire, my kid is happy at this new school. Like we've relocated my ex is you know, uh, just on the other side of town basically. And we've made it happen and it's through the power of, of fasting. And that made me want to do another one at the end of, um, 2023. So January, just this past January coming off of the holidays, just feeling like I'd overindulged like so many people did and um, just went, that's it. I'm doing, I'm just going to do a fast. I'm going to see how long I can go. Ended up doing a, a five day fast. And to your point, Alec, about the ability to still do physical things, I didn't stop going to the gym and mm-hmm. I actually, uh, I actually hit not my PR, but my PR since stopping lifting, um, to three, it was like three forty five on a deadlift. Like I'd set a goal coming into 2024. Like I want to deadlift 400 pounds this year. A friend of mine cycles in 48 hour water fasts with lifting really, really heavy. He just does big three sort of power lifting. And he's talked about how he's hit multiple PRs doing this cycling 48 hours water fast with like eating really nutrient dense foods and lifting mm. 48 hours water fast nutrient dense foods and lifting i believe it's interesting i believe it fully i believe it because i i i went into that session i was like all right i i'm gonna see where my you know my one rep max is right now i'm just gonna see what i can do and uh and hit 345 i was like what the? and it was just like day four of a water fast because you're at that time you're feeling the you know you do have the hunger pain um i just think anything's possible while you're on these mm. things and i i think that they're that it makes space for those possibilities. 
And yeah, I, I totally agree. And then rewriting rewriting the story in your head about the need for food. And that food is your fuel. That food is always going to be your fuel to do these things. It's it's completely re- rewritten it in my head. And I think that there's way more that's possible when you remove this stuff from your from your life for periods of time. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider sharing it with at least one friend or family member who you think could benefit from hearing it. You help us grow and reach more people by sharing it with those around you. Also, be sure to head to the show notes to check out our membership offerings, membership marketplace, and more. We all know that big ag is poisoning our food supply and big pharma's so-called medicine is straight up poison. What most people aren't aware of, though, is that most supplements are also filled with artificial sweeteners, dyes, GMOs, glyphosate, and a host of other toxic ingredients, even many of the more natural supplements. My good buddy James Benefico dedicated his life to crafting the world's cleanest, most nutritious organic supplements after a pre-workout energy drink caused heart palpitations so severe that he almost landed up in the ER. Organic Muscle was born, revolutionizing sports nutrition by using exclusively non-GMO ingredients from USDA organic farms. Since then, tens of thousands of people, including myself, have leveled up their fitness and their health with Organic Muscle's award-winning natural pre-workout. There's no jitters, no heart palpitations, no itchy skin, just nourishing organic food and herb-based ingredients for clean, sustained energy, strength, endurance, and recovery. Numerous studies have shown that Tonka Ali is the most effective herb in the world for naturally boosting testosterone levels. And we know that testosterone levels are depleting all over the world because of what's put in the food supply, what we're exposed to, Organic Muscle has the world's first fully organic Tonka Ali supplement. I only support and promote things that I actually use and I can say I legitimately use Organic Muscle products. Use code FORWARD15 at checkout for 15% off at organicmuscle.com. I've just reframed what I look at as nourishment altogether and I used to be obsessed with trying to figure out like, oh, is, is the vegan, like raw vegan diet the best? Because I have people who thrive on that. Is is carnivore, is ketovore, is right. paleo, you know, just just trying to figure out which one is best. And the conclusion that I've come to is that we are looking at nutrition in a completely flawed way because we are assuming that nutrients from food are the primary source, if not exclusively the source of energy for our bodies. When I now look at nutrition or or nourishment or energy production or or energy potential as a function of our our body's ability to convert various forms of chi or, or, or of life force or of prana into fuel for our body to be able to do what it does. And that sort of recontextualize how there are people who the way they're constituted, especially when it comes to their beliefs about food may thrive on just eating raw fruit for like 30 to 40 years. And then other people who thrive on eating just animal products for an extended period of time. And some people who claim, you know, I've not verified myself that these people are, to be breatharians. Like, I think that is totally 100% in the realm of, of possibilities because it's simply just our body's ability to convert various forms of chi into fuel for the body to use to do what it needs to do. Especially if you grow up with the awareness that that is even an option, right? As Americans, we don't have any any we're very ignorant as to like multicultural practices, uh, what be it indigenous or just, you know, other countries. We're very myopic as Americans, I think. But if you grew up knowing that uh, breatharianism is even a thing and what's more, something that you could practice, you know, we're all, you know, I'm in my forties, Alec, how old are you in your thirties? 31. Yeah. So like, you know, we're, we didn't grow up with this knowledge where it's like sort of like trial by fire. Like you said, like we experiment ourselves and we throw it, but, just think of how different uh, one's life would be if if these were just normal ideas right. from childhood. Exactly. Yeah. It, I mean, it would be totally different. And I, I don't want to go off on a huge tangent here. And I, I want to be careful of 
saying, I can't say who it was, but I saw two kids read blindfolded when I was in Mexico at Anarcapulco and like play catch blindfolded. <laughs> and I tried on the blindfold myself and they were like, it was pitch black. <laughs> like you couldn't see anything. Wow. And these kids could read. I even put a piece of paper in front of my phone and they had the blindfold on there, still able to read everything on my phone. And all that to say, the the abilities that we all have innately, or at least the potential for them is there. Yeah, We are just totally misled on how truly powerful we are and how much potential we have as human beings. Yeah. Well, you said, you, and I think, and I think one, one more, go on the tangent. You said you didn't is, want to, but go on it. <laughs> Take yeah. One, one more addition to that is like, we, we, we are so rooted in a materialistic paradigm of life that we think that the only things that are real are physical. We are tricked into thinking that. And that was another thing, both, you know, this experience of seeing these kids and also my, my water fast showed me is that the, the metaphysical happenings of life are far more important than what is going on physically and actually inform the physical processes of life and help physical processes of life sort of optimize. And I mean, I think that it, it's easily easy to mentally masturbate, so to speak, on that topic right. and like make it a mental exercise to how that makes sense rationally. But until you have direct experience of that or directly witness something, you won't know it. But once you do, you can't look the other way. And that's where like, for me, when it comes to health right now, I'm dealing with digestion stuff. And previously I would have like immediately turned to what nutrients does my body need? What this, what that? And uh, now I know that the foundational thing that is causing these digestive issues is emotional. Mm -hmm. It's it's something about my beliefs related to some relationships with some of my family members that have been very traumatic that I need to resolve. That it, it's about me having to resolve those metaphysical processes that I'm dealing with in order to have optimal physical <laughs> health. Yeah. And to riff on what you were saying a moment ago about this sort of departure from materiality is that we're, we're sort of all learning to put consciousness first, which is one of Mark Gober's theses. And I just finished his, um, an end up upside on Liberty. And it, I didn't really know where it was going, but that's where that book resolves itself is that consciousness is it. And like you said, we can wax poetic and it can all get all sort of highfalutin and philosophical. But when you when it can inform the way you proceed through the materium, it is quite profound. Right. And I, I think that that's why fasting is so, and you know, Ben, you brought up how you would not have this house. You would not be sitting in that room if it weren't for the fast. And you brought up the prayer and this connection and you even got emotional during it. And I'm like, damn, I know exactly the same feeling. And I think that that's why fasting was offered as a spiritual practice throughout various religions and esoteric philosophies and spiritual practices over the last thousands and thousands of years across the world. And it's because like more than the physical healing, and don't get me wrong, like the physical healing of fasting is incredible. I mean, when I interviewed Lauren Lockman, he talked about countless people with stage three, stage four cancer coming to him. Um, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune conditions across the board that they are then able to resolve. Um, I want to be careful with my words. This is not medical advice. Uh, <laughs> resolve through through fasting. And um, but but more than that, for me, I think you both would agree is the is the the connection that you experience to all around you just the, just the, the the deep knowing the direct experience of i am a part of something i am inextricably linked to all these other things that that have something foundational to them that is far greater than what i am seeing or sensing with my five senses that we know we have mm -hmm. right there's something here that is so profound 
And that's why fasting is so powerful. It gives you that direct experience into the, the concept of, of oneness, right? Is, is, is knowing that you are truly linked and inextricably linked to all things around you. And you have this connection to something that is greater than you, that people give names like God or source or universe or all that is, but you experience that connection in a very direct way when you fast. Yeah. It sort of fast tracks uh, simplifying your life. I mean, I feel like the Ben story is sort of an anomaly where he just cruised right through his work week and bought a house and drove to New Hampshire and, and all that. Yeah, that's incredible. That 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 is really a special uh, event, Ben. That that um, that really amazes me. But I I think what fasting does. We all know that we work too hard and we're stressed out and we have to quote slow down. It's very hard to do very hard to do. You know, we all have kids. We have, you know, like you said, Alec, financial strains and trying to make a living, especially in like sort of, a, you know, this alternative space and, you know, far away from the mainstream culture. Um, but when you fast, you can use it as a vehicle to slow your life down with intention. And it's really effective. Uh, like I said, you need to have the time to do it, or I, at least I do. Uh, yesterday, you know, it was, it was, uh, I'm in upstate New York. It's, February. It's generally very cold. Yesterday was hit 58. I was outside in the sun with no shirt on, uh, just doing some breathing and some meditating and basking in like sort of the first sun of, of the year for my, my pale ass skin. And, and, uh, some honeybees came and landed on me, blew my fucking mind. One landed, uh, I have this sort of like, I don't like to use the term, but it's sort of this arthritic pinky joint, like the very first joint in my finger. Again, it's from, 25 years of playing guitar and planting that finger, sort of a repetitive stress thing. That's right where the bee landed. Just like uh, our guest was Paula Cantrell. Was that her name, Benny? Um, Paula Carnell, yeah. Carnell. The the, the bees know where you need help. And the other one landed, I had a copper bracelet and it just walked right around the copper bracelet like three (laughs) times. And so what did that inspire me to do? I, you know, I went down and visited the bees and there they were buzzing for the first time of the season. So I brought them, uh, some sugar water to help them get going. And, and just, I had no fear. I didn't put on a suit or anything because they came and found me and said like, Hey, we're out here too. And we could, <laughs> we could use a little spring, spring help. And then I'm barefoot and muddy feet and picking shiitakes off the logs that just popped up. And, um, but it's cause I slowed the fuck down. Right. right. I slowed the fuck yeah. down. And then it's just like nature sort of rose up to meet me. It's like, Hey, Come, come hang. <laughs> come hang out. Yeah. You, you just become acutely aware of those just subtleties of, of life. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's beautiful. Like it's beautiful. It's things that we would typically not even have awareness of, not even see. Like, you, you know, when I go outside in my normal day-to-day life and a bee lands on me, I'm like, fucking get yeah, off. Right. Like, I know. I get know. off, bee. <laughs> you, know, you get that adrenaline and that little bit of fear and don't sting me. And yeah. Yeah, I know. Right. And I welcomed it. Wow. Like for the first, that was sort of new because I, even though I'm a beekeeper and I'm a novice, you know, I just threw myself into this whole permaculture journey in 2020 when I couldn't be on the road anymore. Um, but yeah, it was like a, it was a visit from a friend for the first time. That's so cool. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Uh, I, I want to circle back to, I think it's actually very interesting. I love that you went to Colorado. You sort of like went on a, you, like a self-imposed retreat in many ways, right? But like, you know, driving you know again i'm a musician what do we do we drive for a living and play for free is what we say we drive and drive and drive like a 12-hour drive or 14-hour drive is is no joke you know and buying store-bought water it's it's sort of not surprising that that would sort of be like a rough re-entry back to back to the real life you know what did i yesterday on day two i drove to the spring and i filled up you know about uh 20 gallons of spring water, visited Mrs. Ortlieb uh, at the top of the mountain in Kerhonkson, this 90-year-old woman whose husband put the spring in or put the pipe in uh, in the 50s, and she's very, very proud of it. She comes out and visits and gives you a little piece of paper that tells you about basically structured water, even though she doesn't use those terms, and uh, wow. Masaru Emoto is referenced on the... So I got to have a little social time with Sis Ortlieb, and then not knowing how long I was going to go. I still don't know how long. And although you've inspired me with your paddle boarding story to maybe just blow right through the skiing weekend. Um, 
Yeah, I went to the health food store and I got some organic coconut water for preparing for my re-entry. I thawed out some bone broth from the freezer. Um, but that's all by way of saying it's, it's I think it really, it, if you're going to do this, folks, just do the basics, like forge some spring water or, fi- or find a way to make your water coherent. Make an exit plan, like have some coconut water or some fresh fruit. Um, you You don't have to overthink it, but at least do the basics, right? Right. Yeah. I think the intention behind it is so, so, so important. And you like, let's put it this way, the way that I was taught to do the fast and this worked in my direct experience is to sip water slowly throughout the day. I'm talking sip. Yeah. But what that also forces you to do is be very, very present because you're having to remember to sip pretty frequently and just be with your water. So you're not, um, you're, you're catching yourself when your thoughts wander off into the future or catching yourself when your thoughts worry about the past, um, because you're wanting to be present with the water. And then again, of course, as the emotions come up, you just feel them and move through them and then get right back to sipping water. But, um, yeah, the, the, the intention behind the water fasting is really important. And that's what you don't want to do is chug. You, um, you want to ensure that you're drinking water that is coherent, whether that's naturally coherent, like spring water, like you said, or water that you bring back into coherence with a vortexing device or an analemma wand. Um, I made a point to pray every time I filled my water bottle all the way up, I would pray over the water, uh, referring back to Veda Austin or Masaru Moto's work. We know that that actually has an effect on the water. And, um, yeah, it was, I, I think that's one of the most important pieces is the intention behind it. It's a question for both of you. It's something that, that I've discovered, and this came up in conversation with Andy Kaufman when we had him on and he mentioned fasting he looked to nature and said that animals in nature will fast when injured it's almost like a uh, like a first aid kit piece of the first aid kit and i had never done this before but uh early february i felt myself coming down with something like a sore throat um started getting symptoms of whatever you want to call it a detox and instinctively i stopped eating I said, all right, I know, I know what's coming on. I'm just going to go into a water fast and see what I can do, see if this will help facilitate my body going through this process and coming out the other side. And I'm wondering if either of you have, have done that or Alec, if you've maybe incorporated fasting, not as an intentional thing that I'm going to plan on the calendar for 21 days, but as a reactive thing, well, this is what my body's telling me I need to do. And I did it and I noticed that rather than an increase in the symptoms and a plunging into, you know, three days of having to lay low and lie on the couch and feel miserable, my symptoms actually never got worse. And I quickly came out of what I had thought was going to be a lot worse, a little session of detoxification. Yeah, I mean, I think it's dead on. And I always remember back to that's what Lauren Lockman had told me, too, that when animals start to get sick or get injured, they immediately just lie down and don't eat. They don't do anything. They just lay there. And I'm like, okay, well, the the body, he also said another quote that the, the organism is what heals the organism. So just allowing the body to do what it was designed to do to come back to homeostasis, if you will, mm-hmm. I think is the best thing that you can do when you start experiencing symptoms is not add more to your body because that means your body is having to put energy towards digestion when you're wanting it to be freed up to put energy towards cleansing. So just immediately going into a fast is the best thing that you can do to help your body cleanse in my opinion. And would I say that that applies 100% throughout? I can't know that, but I can only say in my direct experience and hearing from other people and then referring back to what happens in nature, that makes the most sense is just allowing your body the energy that it requires to cleanse. And I think uh, adding in some things like just breathing deeply, meditating, spending a lot of time outside grounding. I always remember back to 
uh, Steve Falconer um, from the channel Space Busters. I had a phone call with him just catching up like, I want to say like six months ago. And he had been dealing with some lingering shoulder pain. He has this big uh, garden. You could really call it almost like a, a farm in Denmark. And he said he made a point to just stand barefoot outside in his garden as he was doing the work. And after like six days time, his shoulder pain resolved itself just by putting his feet on the earth. And this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's just reconnecting with nature in a, in a very literal way yeah. and in a very direct way um, is, is just doing the very simple things like spending time outside with your feet on the ground. Sounds so unbelievably simple, but that's what helps our body come back to a, a cleansed and healed state. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, absolutely. I, I immediately, anytime I start feeling anything, just jump to fasting. And, That's like the first thing that I and do. Speaking of, since you brought up Steve, who's a hero of ours as well, um, it was after our conversation with him about his esoteric biochemistry film. I think that was about a year ago, last January. Uh, when I became aware of the lunar return concept and that that's a series of days um, when the moon is back where it was when you were born, that you might want to be a little more meditative and slow down and maybe even clean up your diet. And I've taken it to the point where that's, I'm going to, I basically do at least a one day water fast whenever my lunar return uh, comes around, which is now, it happens to me now. So I decided to go for the whole week. Um, but it's fun to just experiment and like in sort of, as we say, habit stack, these ideas, um, a water fast during my lunar return makes a heck of a lot of sense to me. Um, I also want to say, cause it seems worth mentioning, you know, Alec, you did 17 days and Ben, you did eight on your very first one. But like for me, the first one was two days and I followed with a one day and you don't have to win the gold medal folks out there. Right. It's like, start, start slow. Like do one day, do half a day, just do the morning. Um, totally. and just sort of get your body used to the, the idea. Uh, there's a lot of power. And like you said, Ben, when you were sick the other day, you just did a day or two and just sort of, there's no shame in just doing a short water fast for heaven's sake. And I don't think you need to do like a one or two or three day with the guidance of someone Correct. else. I'm not going to say that that, you know, it doesn't help. It, it might help to have the guidance of someone who's done quite a few fasts, but you know, I don't, I don't think you need that guidance. And again, this is not medical advice, but that's like, I would not feel the need to have guidance from someone else doing one that, that that's that short. Now on ones that are extended, um, first off, like, I think that to, I agree with you, Mike, in that you don't have to immediately jump to these extended fasts. And I think situations where it may benefit you to work with someone who offers services to guide you through extended fasts are if you're dealing with a very chronic issue Absolutely. or an acute issue yeah. that is relatively speaking quite serious, that might make sense for you to do an extended fast. And your body can go from having never fasted before to doing these extended fasts. Absolutely. Um, pending that you are doing it guided by someone else, in, in, in my opinion. Um, and it's not that like there there's uh, major, major concerns there and, and that you could die if you do it incorrectly. I, I don't sort of feed into the fear mongering of that. But in order to properly cleanse and detoxify with that length, I think it would you'd benefit from um, using someone else's services. And another thing that I wanted to bring up with that too is I've had a lot of feedback from women who have done extended fasts and say that it absolutely wrecked their hormones mm -hmm. or it made them feel worse. Mm -hmm. And I do think there is some nuance in that for some people, and I think especially women of childbearing age or, <laughs> of course, women who are pregnant or trying to become pregnant, I don't think that your that that women's bodies specifically are made to do extended fasts again with the context that it, i'm speaking to women who aren't dealing with an acute or chronic issue that is really 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 bad now if you know someone has stage three or four cancer or something like this um i would exp i would recommend um, just exploring working with a professional who is very knowledgeable on extended fasting. But if you're a woman who's relatively healthy, I just don't think that there's that there's a reason to, and you might benefit from doing another type of cleanse. Like there's 
um, a, a good friend of mine whom I will not name out of respect for her had a really bad experience doing an extended water fast and actually felt worse afterwards mm -hmm. hormonally felt horrible. And she wasn't dealing with health issues beforehand, which is kind of the point. Um, but she just did a raw goat's milk cleanse for, I think like 12 days. And, um, last I'd heard from her, she said she's feeling great. So that might be another way to sort of do a fast cleanse without having to do an extended one as, as a woman. And I don't know exactly why it is that women struggle, um, or that some women struggle with this, but I'd imagine that it's because women's bodies are designed to provide uh, nutrients and, and nourishment, not only for themselves, but for another being. So yeah. they need, uh, th they just need more nutrients than men may need possibly. Yeah. They're on call. That does make a lot of sense. They're on call. Yeah. They're on call. That's the best, <laughs> the best way to say. They're on call for a baby yeah. possibly. Yeah. yeah. Or to be a wet nurse or who knows, right? Especially yeah, when you look exactly. again beyond our American culture. Um, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. I also want to mention that on the heels of what you said, Mike, and this is maybe the, the flip side of it, that you don't need to be a hero. Start with 12 hours, do 24, do a day. But I also want to remind people that if you set a goal, like Alec, you set a goal, you didn't quite hit it, but you went really far. If you set a goal for seven days, eight days, 14 days, there are moments and for me, definitely day three, day four, when I felt the, the cravings and I felt real hunger. And there were probably times where I felt maybe not lightheaded, but not 100%. Things were happening physically and probably also emotionally as well. And it's very challenging. And I think that it's important to remind the listener that listen to your body, but also understand that it's meant to be challenging. Right. And maybe you, maybe you pull the ripcord, but also have confidence in that you can go, that you can go farther. That maybe that the challenges that you're feeling, the cravings, those deep cravings that you're feeling, or even like the, the, the headache maybe that you're feeling, this is the water fast doing the work. This is your body doing the work that's needed. Alec, when you when you did your so your long run, did did you have someone that you were working with? No, I did. Well, kind of. I was working with this guy that I'm friends with named Doctor Robert, but not directly. Like this was like day three into the fast. Like, hey, I'm in the middle of the fast. <laughs> Any advice? Yeah. He's like, oh, okay, right. Um, but I, I couldn't agree more with what you just said, Ben. Um, and it it does require that you really, really get quiet and listen to distinguish between, oh, something is wrong versus, oh, no, this is just very uncomfortable because my body is starting to cleanse. Or no, this is uncomfortable because I'm mentally latching on to the, the need for food or, you know, wanting to avoid experiencing these emotions, et cetera, et cetera. And I can't say for others, what that will look like, it's going to be unique to the individual. And that's where it requires that you really, really get quiet in order to distinguish between yeah. the, those uh, feelings. And I also agree with what you said in that days three and four in my experience of the long fast were the most challenging, like were the most challenging by far when it came to food cravings and also differentiating between like, Oh, am, is something wrong? And I think that's why I had actually reached out to Dr. Robert. I was like, Hey, how do I know the difference? Mm -hmm. And he said the same thing. He was like, you got to get quiet. But as long as you are sipping slowly throughout the day, you're hydrating your body just fine. Pending that it is, you know, spring water or, or water that you have brought back into coherence. And the one thing that I did do that Andy Kaufman did not do, which is interesting. He, he went 26 days without adding any minerals whatsoever to the water. It was just reverse osmosis or distilled one or the other that he brought back into coherence with the analemma wand. For me, I did put a little bit of Celtic sea salt in the water mm -hmm. as minerals. And I, you know, th that worked for me, but I don't think you need to do that. Like if you want to say in terms of a purist, Andy Kaufman was a purist and he did that for 26 days. I was pure in that I did not have teas. I did not do anything. Um, 
but I did have Celtic sea salt that I added to my water and I only did it sometimes though. And, um, I don't, I, I can't say that I noticed a difference in terms of hydration or of detoxification with doing the Celtic sea salt sometimes and not the other times. But I did again, notice the distinct difference between drinking highly coherent water that I was very intentional about, um, versus drinking store-bought quote spring water that was in these plastic gallon jugs like that was a, a distinct difference in terms of the nourishment that my body felt on a freeway <laughs> on a freeway on a 14 hour <laughs> drive on a highway <laughs> coming back to texas yeah. yeah well the other thing that came up with that is that i didn't spend a ton of time outside yeah, and i was exactly during the fast and i didn't you know do sun gazing and have bare feet on bare earth i did try to breathe deeply while while driving but you're not able to sort of just sit and be present not having to focus on doing something else when you're when you're driving so i think it was a combination of sort of all of those things that required that i just stop yeah um yeah which is why it's really incredible that you did eight days ben and you didn't you weren't able to be um like totally 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 present with just the fast the whole yeah, time yeah nothing else changed in my life um besides removing removing food and it's it's actually interesting that and i wanted to bring this up you're left with a lot more time in your day when you You remove that that was one of the things that that shocked me was how much time i had during the day to get to to get stuff done because you're usually planning out a meal shopping for food prepping the meal cooking the meal cleaning up from a meal Mm -hmm. eating the meal (laughs) <laughs> those are hours. Those yeah. are hours in hours. your day. And when you take that out, all of a sudden you've got a lot of time. Totally. Well, and and this is why I think whether it's a physical thing that you're dealing with or emotional, again, with the the distinction that um women of childbearing age, I, I think they could be okay like on a two to five day fast, but I'm talking these extended ones. You may only want to do that if you're dealing with a really, really chronic health issue. Mm. But um Again, whether it be physical or non-physical issues that you're dealing with health-wise, I I think that you could benefit from fasting, again, because just by cutting out food, which we turn to when, when coping a lot more than we realize, and also having a lot more time by not having to prepare food or think about food, it does force you to be present with your emotions. It forces you to. There, there's no escaping it. And of course, you could escape by turning to those things that I had mentioned earlier. But if you're really intentional about it, you you have to just sit with them. And it's such an incredible experience because it's a direct experience that those things that you were, seemed so scary for you to feel don't actually have any power over you. And if you just allow them to flow through you, you have this experience of like, wow, like I am powerful myself to deal with these things and they aren't that scary. I just needed to feel them. That's it. I just needed to just feel them and they go away. That's Mm. it. Yeah. Well said. Alec, when we had uh, Dr. Grayson Dart on, he mentioned that the Wendy's Baconator was the craving that popped up for him. And it was funny because it was something that he hadn't eaten in years. What were your cravings? Man, so... Days three and four, like I said, I was with my dad, so he was cooking, right? So just cravings were whatever he was cooking. And I was like, oh, damn. He's like, dude, I'm so sorry. But what was so funny (laughs) is days five onward, I didn't have cravings, but just the smell of food was satiating. mm -hmm. But like it felt like I was nourished just by smelling food. And then it got to a point, this is pretty hilarious, and this is 100% true. I could actually like, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but I could show you the uh, the list of different restaurants that I made in Austin, Texas. So <laughs> I, I want to say it was day like 11 or 12. This is hilarious. I shared this in my update. I spent eight hours. I'm, dude, eight hours um, on this one day. And maybe this wasn't super intentional, but like I just enjoyed it so much. Just watching top 10 food videos. <laughs> And that was like the most time that I spent on my phone was that day was just watching these top 10 food videos. And it what and my wife was like, why are you torching yourself? And I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. 
this is not torture just by looking at these like plates of barbecue <laughs> in Austin or this Asian food was like, Oh my God, I can, I can like put myself in the shoes of me experiencing that in the future. And it felt like I was being nourished. Yeah. But I'm talking like, hold on, let me pull this up. This, this restaurant's list that I made. Man. Yeah, dude, it was, I had it broken down by seafood, <laughs> burgers, Mexican, French tacos, <laughs> American, Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, Korean, Asian fusion, sushi slash Japanese, barbecue, pizza, Southern, sandwiches, Italian, African, breakfast places, farm to table places, farm to table breakfast places, is <laughs> breakfast places. And I'm talking like, this list is insane. Like, and that was just one day of just watching different <laughs> top 10 food videos, but it wasn't craving. It was just like, wow, like this food looks so beautiful. And I was like really trying to tune in which one was more intentionally made this restaurant, this farm to table one seems really good. I want to experience that when I eat eventually. It's when more like I, reveling than craving. <laughs> yeah. Right. When I was on the eight day and, uh, when, when this, when this piece of property came up and I was like, okay, Lancaster, New Hampshire, I remember looking on the phone and looking at all the restaurants that were in this town and nearby. And, and I found myself visual, like looking at the menu, just dissecting the menu and think, and like almost visualizing myself ordering various things on the menu and eating it. And I joked with Mike that I think I manifested myself in Lancaster because I thought of all the, myself eating at the restaurants nearby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and was it like torture for you or was it like an exercise of, wow, this is incredible. I, I can't wait to experience it. it wasn't, no, it wasn't torture. It was not torture. Uh, I would definitely like, I could, I could taste the food. I could smell totally, the food. Here, here. But I did it. If it was torture, I probably would have stopped. But I, exactly. yeah, I did it. And I was like, it was, it was, a, it was creating a wonderful anticipation of right. hitting these places. Um, exactly. But it didn't make like me, it didn't bring hunger no. for me. It didn't make me be like, oh, I want to stop my fast so bad no. right now. It was just like, wow, look at this amazing food. Well, and then you really do appreciate food once you're able to eat it again for the first few meals. You, I was so mindful about how I was consuming the food. And then, of course, after some time slipped right back into, oh, I got to get to a meeting, so I just need to stuff this food down. But right. the point is, like, when I'm regularly fasting, that makes me appreciate food so much more. And then I view food, like, obviously, there's there's nourishment that food provides. But again, not the only source of nourishment. But it's also that it's like an artistic expression of human beings. Mm -hmm. and it's like, wow, look at this artistic expression where human beings add it all it's like alchemy it's like it's like a direct version of of a form of alchemy that is like art that you then consume and it's like you're consuming the intention behind the food more than just the nutrients of the food which makes the importance of eating organic and eating grass-fed grass-finished meat so much more important because it's the intention that goes into it rather than the substance itself or maybe the intention informs the the ability of our bodies to take in the substance it's also it's ephemeral it's like a buddhist mandala it's not meant to yeah. sit there and be observed for life or hung on a wall you it's a lot of energy and thought goes into the creation and preparation of this meal particularly if you're out at a restaurant with someone who does this for a living but then it's consumed right. that's it it's consumed and it's going to turn to poop <laughs> right exactly yeah it's a beautiful thing well speaking of of poop and bowel movements i'm i'm fascinated that you had one so deep into your fast and i'd love to to know a little bit more about that what other when those movements stopped why that one happened and what it was like and then i've got a, a interesting story about my five day and a bowel movement yeah so days so days th one, two, three, four, five-ish, I had bowel movements. Then days six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I didn't have any. But then days 11, 12, and then for sure days 13, 14, I had bowel movements again. And it was like, I mean, again, keep in mind, this is, this is now two weeks, give or take, of not having any food yeah. at all. Yeah. And my body is passing stuff. And I think it's just that, Again, when you're when your body is not bombarded with okay, time to cleanse. Oh, more food. Okay, crap. Well, we got to process this one, and yeah. then we'll get to that. And that's what our bodies are constantly doing for those who never fast. 
now when you allow your body time to focus on detoxifying, I think your body also is able to just cleanse whatever is in your intestines or clogged up in your, your kidneys, um, clogged up in your liver and in your, uh, stomach and is able to focus on pushing that stuff out. Um, so, you know, days, days 11, 12, 13, 14, and again, especially days 13, 14, I had a lot of, not a ton of bowel movements and they weren't painful. They weren't like diarrhea or anything like that. They were like solid substances coming out of my body. And that's where it's like, wow, this stuff has been just sitting in there for God knows how long. Um, and I, I wish that I was able to, uh, continue and, and do it into 21 days. Cause from hearing from other people, they had some crazy bowel movements sort of days 20 and onward um, where like, this is going to sound gross, but the scent of what they were passing triggered memories for food that they had ate a long time ago. Like one of my friends described how he uh, um, passed this stuff that smelled like these disgusting nachos he had eaten like 15 years prior. And he, it immediately triggered the memory of those nachos upon smelling what he was passing. He's like, Oh my God, that stuff may or may not have been just sitting inside me forever. And now my body's able to finally get it out of me. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't painful. It wasn't, um, like super like raunchy smelling or anything like that. It was just like, wow, this stuff has been sitting inside of me for quite some time and my body's now able to finally clear it. I think that detail alone should be one of the most compelling for anyone out there who's on the fence that right. you've got things in there that may not come out any other way. And this might be the only way that you're going to get it out. Right. It's like the plumbing in your house. And everyone knows that if the plumbing in your house gets stuck, it's not working properly and you're going to have issues right. down the road. You're going to have issues if you don't take care of it. And this is how you fix and clear out the plumbing in that body. This is the way to do it. Yeah. My, uh, I did it. So the, the five day I did, I stopped, I, I think like day two, day three was my last poop. And then day five, I had the sensation that I had to, had to go and I went to the bathroom and it was, I, I broke out into a sweat, like a full body sweat. And I felt like I had something big to pass, but I didn't, but I felt like wow. I had the sensation that I had to and broke out into a sweat and actually had to lie down. I stripped off my clothes and I, I was on the tile floor in the bathroom, just closing my eyes, breathing, letting my body cool off. I mean, it was every pore of my body was sweating and it lasted for like two yeah. minutes or something. Do you have any insight like intuitively into what that it was? It is a great question, Alec. And and I need to separate the physical from the non-physical. So did I have something physical that needed to pass? Or was this like an emotional thing that the water wow. fast triggered that I needed to process in this way? And it reminded well, me... Well, especially with the idea, right, that like our cells store memory of specific traumas. Yes. Right. So maybe this was that being mobilized through the water. Fast. Yes. And it reminded me of um, my my only experience doing ayahuasca down in Peru the day before I was supposed to do it. I had some food that I probably shouldn't have had. And I actually I, I had some sort of food you know, poisoning event and I was diarrhea all the way leading up to this ayahuasca ceremony. I had nothing in my body, wow. nothing in my body. And when you do ayahuasca, they give you buckets because it's, uh, you, you're, you're expected to purge either mm. through your mouth or through your rear. And I had, when the ayahuasca set in, I leaned over my bucket with this intense urge to throw up. And there was nothing physical in my body that came out, but it felt like I had a dinosaur egg, literally like something the size wow. of a dinosaur egg come out of my being into this bucket and there was really nothing it was like a dribble of drool but that's <laughs> wow. sort of the sensation i had on the toilet was like oh my god i really have to go like i've been holding in it's almost like you'd been three days without going to the bathroom and all of a sudden something had to come out like that was the sensation that something 
giant had to come out of my body when in fact there was nothing in there. It, it wow. is fascinating so that your, your body gave you that, like, you know, we have that sensation basically every day. You're like, okay, well, it's time for me to go to a private place where I can allow this bodily function to happen. It sent you that signal, but that's not what actually happened. But it still sent you that signal. Go to a private place, yeah. close the door, lock the door, and let this happen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, there's more to it. I think uh, th there's just so much more to it than the physical. And at the same time, as I was telling Mike, and I've said this before, if I were to ever have a diagnosis, like you have cancer, I don't know how I would find, how I'd come to that place because I don't see myself going to a doctor to get that diagnosis. But if I ever did, the one thing that I would do first and foremost, that this would be my first thing that I do. I would do a 21 day. I would go, guys, I'm, I'm checking out. I'm going down to Costa Rica. I'm going to do a water fast. That is the modality that I would do. And then it, it, for me, it's beyond, you know, beyond cancer, any sort of health scare that I might have that I can imagine having, this is what I would do. This is the modality. 100%. And again, because whether it's physical or metaphysical, something that you're dealing with, you know that when you fast, you are forced, your, your body's going to cleanse. So if it's it's more physical, and I think there's you know some blurred lines of separation between the two, I think they're really one and the same. But the point is, you're going to have to cleanse physically, and you're going to have to feel emotions that you may not have wanted to feel and feel those feelings and cleanse metaphysically as well. So it's, it's, it knocks out both. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's, I think the most powerful healing mechanism that we have, and that's why animals in nature immediately turn to fasting when they're dealing with something. Alec, how are you going to work water fasting or extended water fasting into your life moving forward? Yeah. So this is a great question. So I will, um, actually what I'm doing right now is a one day fast, uh, once a week yeah. for like, while I'm dealing with this digestion stuff and I'm doing a very specific diet and this was recommended by Andy. So I'm going to try it out, but it's a BBB and E diets. It's, uh, beef, bacon, butter, and eggs. And that's like the only thing that I'm eating for the next month. And then I'm going to do a 24 hour, sometimes maybe 48 hour fast, um, every, once a week. And, um, when, with extended fasts, like I looked at my experience of doing the 15 day, 17 day fast as a, uh, as a sort of initiation as, as me having to go face myself by myself, relatively speaking for the first time in my life. And I think men need that. I think men specifically need that, which is why men do, much better with fasting, not to say that women can't, but men don't have as much issues, um, with, with doing extended fasts. And, um, I think that when I am coming up against sort of a, a barrier in my life, anytime in the future, then I will let my wife know that, Hey, I need to go face myself again for a little bit. And hopefully the circumstances at that time, uh, allow me to go do that because for me at least, and that's why like I commend you, Ben and you right now, Mike, for doing it, um, with your, you know, in, in your house with your, your kids. Um, for me, I need to go be by myself to face myself in order to do an extended one. And that's the right context for me to do. It. And that's not to say that that's the right context for anyone else. Um, that's just how I had to experience it. And, uh, that's, That'll come when I feel intuitively called to anytime in the future. I know that I will do one or more again, for sure. Such a profound experience. Um, but I don't know when that'll be right now. Yeah, I think I, I similarly, I, I've made a commitment to do a quarterly fast, at least like five day fast quarterly. But somewhere on the horizon is a 21 day. And uh, I'll, I'll just wait and see when, yeah. when, and I like that though, when it calls to me, Alec, I want to ask you about resources that you would recommend the listener turn to if they're looking into water fasting. And the reason is because if a person out there Googles, uh, is water fasting good for you or does any sort of Google search on water <laughs> fasting, they're going to find you could, you could go, how many days can you go without food? is a great Google search to do because you will find on the first page 
uh, anywhere from seven days to 21 days to, well, we've heard a rumor that a guy did 60 days. You will not find very good information on the first page of the Google search results. And I did one, how long can you go without food? And I got a series of articles uh, and then halfway down the page, they embed, Google embedded a Google map search that had my house and then eight miles to McDonald's. <laughs> oh my God. I'm not, I'm not, I actually pasted it into the notes. So they, that, they assumed that I was hungry and this is where they wanted to send me was the McDonald's. There's plenty of other restaurants nearby, by the way, there it is. but that's, that's where they sent me. That is insane. Um, one of them, a men's that's health, funny. water fasting is almost always a really bad idea. Uh, the point is it can be challenging, particularly on a topic like this. It can be challenging to find credible sources of information uh, you will you will find plenty of articles on what I would call mainstream medical websites that will emphasize the dangers of water fasting. Of course. Um, there are studies that have been done, plenty of studies that have been done on water fasting. Some of them uh, are specific sources of fasting where the subjects will eat like 250 calories, which isn't what we would call, I guess, a pure water fast. Um, not many studies have, you know, more than 100 subjects. A lot of them are 14, 16. So, you know, to the listener out there who wants to do their own research, which we always encourage, where would you have them turn? Yeah. So I think the go-to that I've come across is Lauren Lockman and his work with water fasting. And I did an episode with him. And I think you guys might have as well. We haven't no, done Lauren um, yet. We did. Do- no, but we have Grace okay. So I, I've done an episode with Lauren and that's episode 10 of the way forward. And he describes how he's had, I mean, thousands and thousands yeah. of people that he's guided through extended water fasts to reverse a number of, of issues across the board. I've sent that episode um, to many people. It's a go-to for me as well. Yeah. The the one thing that I do disagree with Lauren on is the dietary thing, but like it, it's fine. Like everyone has their own thing and he, he may be correct. I may be correct. Who knows? But the point is when it comes to fasting specifically, I think he is dead on. Um and then in addition to that, Andy Kaufman has become quite knowledgeable on fasting and especially uh, the, the details of what exactly is going on in the body when you do extended fasts. And so you can probably head to his website. Um, I think it's just andrewkaufmanmd.com uh, to find info there. And uh, those would be my two go-to resources. And then aside from that, like just your own direct experience and you don't have to start like Mike said with, you know, some extended fast, just do one day and then incrementally work up to two to three and really, really, really be in tune with your body and just listen in on how you're feeling. And I think having a direct experience is the most important thing and you can start slowly. Um, I know it's been, profound in my life doing this this extended fast and i think it's like a running joke where i mention it almost on every episode now and (laughs) my wife kind of does this thing she's like oh you did a fast because of how much i bring it up to other people (laughs) oh you did a fast did you yeah um but it really was it was just so profound It it was such a profound experience for me and i feel like a changed man after having done one and uh i i view health and nutrition and just life in a completely different way than I did before my fast. I love it. Well, Alec, thanks so much for joining us and talking about your experience. Dude, thank you. Thank you for doing this, man. When I said that I wanted to record an episode on fasting, you were like, hey, why don't we just interview you? And I'm like, oh, what heck yeah, idea. That's, that's perfect. So I appreciate it. I'm guys. so glad. Alec, you are a bright shining star out in, in this world. And I'm really grateful for the work you do and the intention you bring to it and the passion and uh, you're you're really one of my favorite voices out there. So it's a it's a real honor to to know you and work with you. Thank you guys. Likewise too. What you guys are doing with the Train Theory Pod is freaking awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, brother.
So many of us dream of buying some land, growing our own food, and becoming self-sufficient away from a society that's gone completely mad. What if it's easier than we think to make that dream a reality? Siblings Jamie and Shelby over at Living the Off-Grid Dream have cracked the code to getting land and living a life of freedom. They'll show you where to find land for $1 down, that's right, $1 down, with low monthly payments as well as how to structure your vision for a homestead, retreat center, regenerative farm, or community. It's one thing to have food, water, and land security, but it's an entirely different thing to have the financial security to buy the land and build it out in a way that aligns with your goals and aspirations. Their program teaches you how to make enough money on your land to cover all of your costs to make that happen. Plus, they've got you covered with pre-filled out plans to give you inspiration if you're not quite sure what your best move for your land is. And if you're a member of The Way Forward, you get a free one-on-one -on -one strategy call with Jamie and Shelby as well as a free bonus gift. If you want to turn your homesteading, off-grid, or retreat center dreams into a reality, join Living the Off-Grid Dream by clicking the link in the show notes or heading to thewayforward.com forward slash off-grid. In nearly all cases with modern health systems, you're waiting months for appointments only to spend a mere 10 minutes with a doctor who quickly hands out a generic diagnosis that is likely rooted in a total misunderstanding of health and causes and then you're offered a one-size-fits-all medication or invasive treatments with unpleasant side effects. If this sounds all too familiar, consider a different approach with the New Biology Clinic founded by Dr. Tom Cowan, a respected natural health doctor, author, and speaker. Dr. Cowan's holistic perspective on health and wellness and a deep understanding of the true nature of health and disease sets this clinic apart. With the New Biology Clinic, it's not about quick fixes and suppressing symptoms. The practitioners take time to understand your unique story, recognizing that health is unique to the individual and that illnesses have a variety of causes, physically and metaphysically. Members of the New Biology Clinic enjoy a flat monthly fee that includes a range of valuable services like health consults as needed, practitioner-led live streams on diverse health topics, access to a members-only resource library, and multiple live group sessions every month. These sessions cover fitness, breathing integration, biofield tuning, guided meditation, EFT tapping, and much more. Unlike traditional healthcare systems that thrive on frequent visits, prescriptions, treatments, and suppressing symptoms, the New Biology Clinic's motivation is to make you healthy and keep you that way. Visit newbiologyclinic.com to learn more and use code the way forward for $50 off your account activation. If you're a member of the way forward, email hello at the to receive $150 off your account activation. Your journey to genuine healing begins here.